Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charvak podcast. Uh, it's time for another episode of Shastra. Today is episode 9 and today's topic is pandemics and policy making. As you know we are in midst of a pandemic uh, or we are I don't know what's happening actually right now. <laughs> it seems we are but everybody seems to be discussing shashank singh rajput on indian television that's that that's the main uh, main uh, discussion point but uh, i wanted to do this discussion for a long time and cover multiple aspects of uh, of uh, you know our lives a, a pandemic is not just a singular event right a pandemic affects us and uh, affects our life in multiple ways it it hits us at the level of economics it hits us at the level of our psychology it hits us at the level of our health obviously and there are different policies that have been taken by this government or state governments all over india we can even maybe look at you know governments across the globe for that matter and what today's discussion's aim is that we need to understand how does one go about making policies when they are in a situation like this like uh, what uh, just examples like what is an ideal lockdown is an lockdown a solution if you have a lockdown how long does a lockdown go how does one read data how does one uh, yeah. you know read science not, not and stuff like that okay so let's start with this so let's start with the doctor on the panel so amit i'm going to start with you so here here's what i want you to do so everybody knows how this uh, uh, series goes we have our panelists every panelist will make their opening remarks for 10 to 12 minutes we'll have session 1 then session 2 will be everybody talks uh, gives their comments on the basis of the opening remarks of the panelists and then we take the questions of the audiences in the latter half so amit let's start with you being the active doctor who's not only a, uh, a medical professional but someone running a covid ward uh, isolation ward uh, as of now so amit what do you think uh, ha- ha- what are your opinions so i don't know how to frame this question because mujhe bhi nahi samajh pad raha question frame kaise karu magar so what are your views how have we done at a policy level when it comes to dealing with the pandemic whether it's at the national level or at the state level i know i mean your views and my views are pretty much in sync about what's happening in the state but i still want you to talk about it so you go first okay thanks kushal now i am running a 55 bed covid hospital which has got uh, 10 icu beds uh, with uh, six patients even now on niv uh, non invasive ventilation and uh, another 30 on high flow oxygen uh, so uh, it it's full on uh, covid management from uh, at all levels which is happening now there are various things at a policy level fundamentally starting with the early policies where in march uh, lockdown was announced at that time lockdown made sense because we didn't know what the hell this virus is and uh, how to tackle it as we gained more information uh, we started you can say uh, gradually realizing the various methods of managing the government was proactive in uh, advising on these measures i would say uh, that uh, okay this these are the guidelines which are currently available they went against the tide in promoting hcq and in retrospect in many big studies they have actually been proven right in in some ways uh, where hcq has in fact been found in many studies to be effective uh, you know there are so many other aspects uh, to this beyond the lockdown thereafter now once we gained enough experience in managing we knew that patients who are uh, in the covid uh, uh, cytokine storm are the worst of the lot they are a small number of people maybe about 1% of the total we learned the various ways of managing these patients safely to navigate them out of this uh, condition thereafter that's why the mortality has constantly been coming down Uh, you know over a period of time as we gained more and more information we got better and better at managing this disease then we started realizing that this is not just about uh, just about the respiratory tract it's affecting so many other organs it's causing an epidemic of strokes heart attacks 
it's causing an epidemic of deep vein thrombosis it's causing so many other systemic manifestations which we could not have imagined it's causing long term debility in a small number of people it's causing permanent lung fibrosis in a large number of people uh, so we still are not aware as to how the health burden of this disease is eventually going to pan out uh, you know right now so at a policy level as far as treatment is concerned it has been not bad i would say in fact recent guidelines of some states have also gone ahead and included ivermectin based on certain studies which were done uh you can say all of it is conjecture but but our government has been liberal enough to allow us to follow whatever protocol we think is working uh so i would say that we are not in the soup that the west is where the mortality is still uh, sky high i would say you know 10 to 15% is ridiculously high for a allegedly best healthcare country in the world right uh now as far as the uh, denial of uh, community spread is concerned <laughs> i think that's like it's been the lowest point i would say <laughs> in the entire thing but icmr kept denying that there is community spread even when we were touching 1 million cases they still said there's no community spread whereas i had said <laughs> and now there are 10 million they say okay it doesn't matter anymore whether there is community spread or not <laughs> that's very funny how we went from no community spread to it doesn't matter at all i mean uh, they should have been upfront about it it was obvious as early as march that community spread is going on uh i have i had pointed it out right towards the third week of march itself that there, there is an unseasonal outbreak of fever which cannot be explained otherwise uh and probably you know we need to check the community because it looks like community spread has already broken out now this was much much before the government ever admitted and i guess it has still not formally admitted but you know i was also attacked by quite a few people saying that how can you say it is already happening i could see what was happening because i'm treating patients right so we could see what was happening at grassroots level now that said they did take measures they were desperate i uh, at that time we weren't manufacturing ppes we weren't uh, we would we didn't have a lot of the stuff which is needed uh, we didn't have capacity to manage a pandemic of this scale uh, capacity building did happen instructions did go out to states as to how to augment their uh, healthcare uh, number of beds and everything uh, most of the states did reasonably well in preparing uh, i will say but the problem is that the most of these facilities have been concentrated in the major metros the small cities relatively uh, the preparation was not up to the mark not up to the so even now when we see i am we are getting referrals of bad patients serious patients from interiors they are coming from uh, uh, from various uh, places in raigad district because my hospital comes under panvel uh, jurisdiction so we are getting patients from uran khopoli alibag pain roha so all the places which are like you know semi urban and just developing small uh, towns and small cities even those places i have got serious problems of supply chain like you know we faced a severe crisis of supply chain of oxygen in the last entire week have been struggling just to keep the oxygen supplies going so these things were pointed out apparently uh, by the network of uh, oxygen gas manufacturers to the government as early as april that we are likely to face a crisis of oxygen sometime down the line what was done regarding that i have no clue whether measures were taken to augment the capacity uh, whether enough cylinder production was started i don't know maybe this needs looking into as to what exactly went wrong that we had to go to this crisis level uh, for the government to intervene so it's been a mixed bag lockdown of course now we all agree that lockdown uh, further extending this lockdown is meaningless now that we know how to manage it all efforts only have to be directed at building up capacity to manage patients but maharashtra government went the other way thinking that okay we have succeeded and and they started dismantling the capacity that had been built which was uh, i mean one of the most ridiculous decisions that i must have seen so 
so amit uh, i want you to explain when you say maharashtra government actually went on and dismantled the capacity what do you mean by dismantling the capacity can you explain that see in now it's no secret that about 65% of india's healthcare is run by the private sector so any uh, pandemic can't be managed successfully without involving the private sector yet government for some reason decided that no we will uh, treat this only at government hospitals not only did they uh, think that they would be able to manage treating it at government hospitals they also uh, made a big deal out of this okay which was a very wrong thing to do in the sense that if one person is detected positive and entire society is sealed off if one person is found positive along a street the entire seat is sealed you know the entire street is cordoned off if one patient is detected positive in a hospital the entire hospital is sealed off you know this was stupid i don't have any other word to describe this but this was stupid it it created a fear psychosis in people that corona ho gaya pata nahi kya hoga times okay and it created a stigma around the disease so instead of people coming forward to get tested the testing itself was limited testing was not let free like you could have freed up testing to private players completely that okay everyone test you only have to report to us make it a notifiable disease like you have done with tuberculosis like you have done with dengue and malaria you made it notifiable disease you make it a notifiable disease instead of restricting testing you create a fear psychosis you restrict testing you seal hospitals because they treated a patient i mean how does that sound which which sane uh, state in the world does this but we did it right so this was the initial steps where where hospitals were literally being victimized for treating patients then once they realized that okay this is not our ball game anymore they started licensing uh, hospitals to uh, become covid hospitals or part or full the big hospitals were authorized to take in a few covid patients whereas the small hospitals were told that you have to be 100% covid so that is how it went at a policy level involving the private sector was a great step because it suddenly augmented the capacity to more than double of what was there by the government meanwhile they also started building up the large mega centers so mega centers have helped uh, to take a lot large chunk of the patients in but a lot of patients were managed in nursing home levels right nursing homes and and relatively lesser number of patients in corporate hospitals because they don't have they didn't give those kind of beds like 500 bed corporate hospital would give only about 70 80 beds for covid care whereas a 50 bed hospital will give all 50 for covid care so it but what happened thereafter in mumbai the numbers eventually started falling last month the numbers came down to about 800 new cases a day which is still a lot mind you 800 new cases a day is not a small number and we must understand that every patient occupies a bed for a large number of days every uh, uh patient will stay in the hospital for at least 8 to 10 days so a 50 bed hospital would be able to manage you know maybe a 100 150 patients a month and here you are adding a thousand patients a day out of which 100 are going to need admission a day even at that rate you needed to have that kind of capacity to be able to deal with this flu but what the government thought is that now we have done everything now let the private sector the small nursing homes for some reason they thought the small nursing homes have a high mortality there's absolutely no basis to this there must have been maybe two or three which had a higher mortality than others but the entire nursing home network of 50 bed or less was taken out in one go 72 private hospitals were removed from the network 10 out of the 16 i believe uh, government hospitals which were managing uh, covid patients were removed from the network now in the private sector alone my personal estimate is that about 2000 beds were reduced and uh, in the yeah and the government sector probably more than that number were reduced so the result is that all the remaining hospitals are completely packed to the brim there is not a single icu bed available right now not a single bed available anywhere mm. and uh, yeah. it's become we are back to june right right now probably in a worse condition because the numbers thereafter just shot up and now we are again at 2000 new cases a day 
now there is again a scramble uh, to get the hospitals they had removed back onto the network so these sort of flip flops don't do anybody any good there was no reason to unilaterally decide if they should have said let it be open and said okay if if you feel that you want to leave the network you are free to leave because we have enough capacity the government should not have interfered and then said suddenly that okay you get out of the network now now those those hospitals have invested money invested additional resources in hiring staff invested money in hiring cylinders to supply the oxygen invested money to do structural changes right you can't just abruptly make such decisions uh, which impact them hugely financially apart from the fact that they capped the co- cost of treatment at ridiculously low rates and went after hospitals for implementing those rates vigorously now that is a separate discussion which which i'll probably so we can get yeah, we can get back into the yeah. second half uh, so i'll i'll get to that in the second half yeah. so uh, ram so now i want to come to you and uh, guys again i'm just going to go run for a couple of minutes and fix my backup internet uh, again it's giving me problems but i need to have a backup so ram uh, you can start speaking now so ram i want you to talk about as we had discussed offline about the uselessness of models you used a very specific word and sp- bad science journalism and amit touched upon it that we have kind of you know scared the shit out of people and uh you know the typical clickbait that is going on when uh, uh, you know when it comes to covid right ram and you know and i also want you to talk about the behavioral science aspects of it I, I, of how we confuse people with individual effects and not make them look at aggregate effects so so ram can you uh, can you speak about that yep sure uh, <clears throat> thanks for setting it up and uh, thanks for all those who joined uh i mean uh, the bit on models is is interesting i mean we always hear this cliche thing that all models are wrong and uh, some are useful uh, i keep saying uh, during the covid times that all models are wrong uh, some are more useless than the others uh, now if you dial back few months uh, to feb and march we saw all these crazy numbers right so uh somebody predicted there could be anywhere between 300 to 500 million uh infections in india and you know a few million deaths uh in the united states where i live uh we saw again crazy numbers uh, saying something like 200 million will be infected and uh, you could be seeing anywhere between 2 to 20 million deaths uh now if and there are several sources on the internet where you can go and check and if you look at where the models stack up um and where the reality is there is a massive gap right uh so pretty much every model is on the high end right uh, and pretty much in most countries the reality is uh, i mean if you plot a graph it doesn't even look like they these data points belong in the same chart i mean it looks like you know from another universe and there have been some models that constantly kind of adjust to what is happening and that's not a great model because if it's adjusting on a day, daily basis it's not giving policy makers or doctors or epidemiologists enough leeway to kind of come up with any reasonable policy if you want to tell me today as to what is going to happen happen tomorrow that's already in motion as scientists kept on saying that wherever you think you are in this pandemic you are already two weeks behind Uh, so a model is supposed to give you a much more uh, you know futuristic kind of view and there are several reasons you know uh, one is that as amit rightly said there are a lot of uncertainties with this uh, uh, it doesn't act like a typical you know influenza virus uh, there is mop mortality and there is also morbidity that you know which we have not kind of accounted for and there are several other variables i think at some stage we should have realized this this entire modeling business is uh, is not getting us anywhere uh, it's only uh, scared a lot of people uh, we had all these pictures of people dying in uh, in the corridors and so on and so forth at some stage we should have kind of junked these models uh, if a model is going to give me a range of 1 to a million it's it's absolutely useless the other thing that's interesting modelers don't have a problem uh, getting it wrong on one end so get, imagine two scenarios a modeling tells you that 10000 people are going to die 
and assume 2000 people i do right you don't actually blame the model you know modeling or the model per se you think it's you know you feel a sigh of relief and say man we were expecting 10000 but only 2000 died it's great now imagine a different scenario a model tells you 1000 are going to die and 2000 die right then you start blaming the model saying you know this model got everything wrong we were prepared for a thousand deaths but hey listen 2000 people died now in all of this right the modeling or the modelers or you know uh, the statisticians who did this modeling don't get any flack and many of them should be reflecting as to what happened to you know 300 to 500 million uh, 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 projections and what it does to future pandemics or future events right so the credibility of the entire modeling business i think uh, uh, is in the toilet so to speak and a lot of policy making therefore fed off that saying that oh uh, now how do we prepare as a country you know for 300 to 500 million infections and then suddenly a lockdown seems like the only possible way i mean i can't prepare a health system so therefore you have a shelter in place or a stay at home order uh, and asking people kind of uh, uh, sit at home and driving down these infections and sometimes when you take a very simplistic or common sense view uh, someone says you know we should drive it down to 10 infections and then we can open up but the point is this thing started with one infection right so uh, so if you're going to have 10 people in a state of a million and sooner than later it's going to kind of get back to its uh, 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 its number or you have crazily unrealistic goals set early on i think california in may set a goal saying only counties that show zero fatalities in a two week period will be allowed to reopen now think of how unrealistic that goal is right in a two week period you have to have zero covid fatalities to reopen now if you set that standard to anything if i set that standard to a sport if i set that standard to a driving if i set that standard to even as simple as running a usual hospital you know a lot of people die because of you know some inadvertent errors that happen here and there i mean that's an impossible standard you know uh, uh, in a lot of situations and therefore we set out on this path of uh not clearly defining as to what our goal of a lockdown is right so are we looking at driving this infection so insignificant that i don't have to worry about anything else and sitting you know, far away sometimes i get this impression in, in india a lot of people thought that this two week lockdown or a one month lockdown is going to get rid of this uh, pandemic right we don't need to prepare for other things and to amit's point therefore some of the smaller cities and smaller towns did not think of alternate models as to how we are going to kind of take care of this the other extreme is uh, is also a level of over preparation and again you can always say uh, you know always better to be over prepared that's when i come to this next point of solutions was straight up uh, thomas sewell kind of keeps making this point that there are no solutions there are only trade offs now think of this simple example in the new york state where they anticipated a lot of infections uh they went and built a lot of these facilities right and i think uh, sometime last week all these facilities were uh, were shut finally they spent 660 million dollars in building these facilities right and guess how many covid patients they they treated uh, some total of zero now you could say you know it's better to, to be prepared but 660 million dollars even for an economy of united states is a lot of money now imagine if that money went somewhere else how many lives would have been kind of saved and therefore we have the situation where we had this modeling uh, and that led to a lot of uh, decision making we did not set a lot of clear goals or we started comparing you know a, a crazy thing like the new zealand thing or what israel is doing and and, and uh, making kind of simplistic assumptions uh, now if you look at it the up numbers are nowhere as 
where they should be with the Maharashtra numbers. When you take population as a base into consideration, the, uh, the numbers are uh, uh, don't match up. And therefore, what we are seeing is that a lot of standard assumptions don't make sense. Uh, each state, uh, each city has to kind of make sense of its own kind of reality. Uh, and therefore, there is a fair bit of uncertainty. And and when you have a lot of uncertainty, what do we seek? We seek more information to deal with that uncertainty. And which is where uh, you know reporting and uh, uh, and science and opinion making comes. Which again, if at all, uh, who has fared worse than the modelers are probably journalists, right? In the way that this pandemic has been reported from day one. Uh, people refer to it as the pandemic pawn or how, I mean, to the to the point you made, Kushal, is that, I mean, choose your poison, right? Do you want stories or do you want statistics? Initially, we heard a lot of these stories, you know, there's this young man in the 20s and this happened to him and uh, you basically ended up scaring a lot of people. And when you went back and looked at the data, it tells you again a very different story. Same thing with children. Now. Uh, my favorite epidemiologist is, you know, Michael Osterholm at SIDRAP, and he keeps making this point: is that when you talk about children, you can't look at the denominator. When you talk about adults, you can say, you know, uh, ten thousand infections and you know, thousand died. But when it comes to children, it's always much more emotional. Uh, you can't use that same statistics. But then we have to face the facts that this has been a lot less dangerous for children, at least here in the U.S. Uh, for uh, as compared to something like a flu, right? But then, uh, reporting did not kind of capture that. And I think what we have is a situation where a lot of journalists who neither understood science nor understood statistics. Uh, but I think it's a great opportunity for media. I mean, uh, between Donald Trump uh, and this pandemic, this has been a, a, a great uh, time for media in terms of getting eyeballs and therefore you keep scaring the shit out of people and more and more will, people will come and read those stories and finally i think the last try is that even the academic journals got into this i mean the kind of silly nonsensical papers that they allow to publish right uh, this downright fraudulent papers on hydroxychloroquine uh, there is a recent study which Hopefully, we'll get debunked uh, on, on mask usage as to how it will kind of drive down the infection. I mean, uh, California had a universal mask mandate for the longest time. It did not, I mean, I'm not saying that they're not useful, they're very useful, but we have these unrealistic expectations, even on masks that you know, from the day you start wearing them, you know, you've kind of defeated this, uh, this pandemic. And therefore, I think one thing kind of led to another. And now we are in this situation where we are not learning from some of the mistakes that we made. And for us commentators, I mean, standard disclaimer, it's very easy for us to kind of comment because we don't have the burden of facing this, uh, this outcome. Uh, and I just want to close my comments again, linking back to trade-offs and solutions. And uh, everybody keeps criticizing, listen to science and listen to science. And to my mind, beyond a point, it's a very silly statement. I mean, of course, you have to listen to science. If I listen to science, it tells me that if I restrict the speed limit on roads to 10 kilometers an hour, I'd be staring at zero fatalities, right? That's listening to science. I could cut down the speed limit to 10 kilometers an hour. I could restrict pedestrians from ever getting onto the streets, and I could be staring at zero fatalities. But that's not how life works. And so therefore you have to think in terms of trade-offs and the people who make these trade-offs invariably are, are politicians because they are the ones who have to kind of bear the burden of their decisions. And at times like this, it feels like a thankless job. And I think many of them have been scared uh, 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 to a point where no politician wants, you know, people dying in, um, in the wards and therefore I have to do something and therefore in times of uncertainty that something becomes do anything and everything they're thinking of unintended consequences the classic case is the shortage of oxygen right you shut down the economy uh, you shut down the state kind of commerce and therefore you're staring at you know, shortage of oxygen in hospitals 
uh, and the very thing that you don't want to, you know, in such crazy times. Uh, but again, these are some of the things I think going forward for policymakers to think about, right? What are some of these unintended consequences? What trade-offs are we willing to make? And then communicate those clearly to the public, saying that we're not going to have a zero fatality situation. That's the unfortunate reality. And these are the trade-offs on the table, and this is what we're doing, as opposed to saying we're going to drive this pandemic down and we're going to play on a mission zero or even one fatality is too much. I mean, these are all moralistic arguments which left is very good at making uh, but they don't match up to reality so harsh now coming on to you um so ram used the perfect word that everything in life when it comes to the larger macro picture or the meta picture is actually about trade-offs and whether we like it or not it is actually about trade-offs. So we went into lockdown. I mean, from what I have understood with my friends, you know, I've spoken to friends outside India is that uh, everybody else in the world had a lockdown. We had a shutdown. We basically shut everything down. We, I don't know if they were locked, but they were shut. So economic activity in the country, we basically shut everything down. And I mean, we thought the, the demonetization and the GST shock was a shock. Boy, did we know that there was something <laughs> like, like this uh, lockdown uh, that was going to come us. So now so Ram used the word trade-off. So from a policy perspective, Harsh, what do you think? How can, how can a person work out? Because let me put this to you, right? We shut the country down where our cases were minimal. We're reopening everything where we have 100,000 cases a day. So, I mean, at least from a rational <laughs> point of view every, I mean, somebody can laugh at us so what are your you know in, in your view what are the lessons that we have taken at a policy level from a, from this pandemic from an economics uh, perspective uh, thank you so much Kushal, for having me it's great to be on this panel with Ram and with Amit ji uh, I just want to first of all thank all the doctors who have been you know serving the patients right now at great personal risk um, so just wanted to mention that I think to your point, obviously, you know, we are in a bit of a 2020 situation right now to comment on what could have happened differently in March or April or even May. So there is the benefit of, you know, just looking back. Uh, but having said that, I think it would be fair to say that, you know, when towards the end of March, a lockdown slash shutdown, as you were saying, was announced, you know, we, we, we needed about a month or maybe a bit more to get around our senses in a policy making sense. What is happening around the world? How can we augment capacity? Uh, but I think somewhere around May or end of May or beginning of June, we kind of lost the plot. And that's where politics took over and the whole federal structure of our union took over. Um, and it's very interesting, of course, very tragic, but academically very interesting what happened. I think. I think one aspect that people miss is that because the states, a large part of the state's revenue comes from GST. And since that was guaranteed for five years starting 2017, they had no incentive really to kind of push back against the union if that required um, against the shutdown because they thought they were guaranteed some kind of money. And of course, that is now being litigated. Um, and because of that, they, I, I do think they thought if there is anything wrong, the political effect might come on them that is the state governments uh, but i think but all the economic damage both in terms of money coming from the center as well as in people's perception would go on the union government so i think that was a case of kind of skewed misaligned incentives um i think this i think the union government well after some time realized that the lockdown is being counterproductive but then the once you kind of have that sort of moral panic in the society. I think the state governments kind of took over from there. And then you had so many on and off regional, local, city-based lockdowns. Even right now in Kolkata, where I'm sitting, just a couple of days ago, we had a complete lockdown. I mean, I don't see how that prevents the virus from spreading in any way whatsoever. But, but we're having that every day right now. So I think it's more of a political signaling at this point. Um, but I think let's just step back and I think and think what has happened with this. I think, you know, Nehru once said to J.R.D. Tata that profit is a dirty word. You know, uh, 
uh, you know, Jay, don't use the word profit in front of me. And I was just listening to, you know, Amit ji, what he was saying. And it is so tragic that in 2020, we still have to understand and discuss and relitigate these things. Imagine you go through such a, such a comprehensive lockdown or shutdown. You at that, you must be using that time because you are after all taking such a huge decision, both the union and the state governments to augment capacity in every way whatsoever, right? You should not be then thinking of that only the state governments, state hospitals would be able to do this on their own. And you actually simultaneously suppress the private sector. Uh, remember, even, even as something as basic as the tests, coronavirus tests, uh, there's all these discussions about can the private labs charge so much money? There were PILs filed in courts. And my point is, have we, I know you're a young country, but have we forgotten exactly how inefficient our public sector enterprises have been? I mean, they've been inefficient throughout the world. So if you are you are accepting that this is a once in a century situation, we need testing, we need beds, we need oxygen instruments, we need all the steroids and all the drugs, then why on earth would we then at that moment try to use blunt price controls? The blunt price controls only send one message. They send the message that the private sector is not welcome. They do not actually solve the supply capacity. This goes to Ram's point of you know, you can create a moral, uh, make an absolutely moralistic statement, but does not is not in tune with the reality. That's very unfortunate. I don't know the details, but I was again following Amitji's Twitter timeline, and apparently he's in some legal case with the Maharashtra state government. Um, it, and that to me just sounds. Imagine one of the best doctors of your state who's running a hospital, and he has to fight a legal case when the pandemic is at its peak. How does it help anybody? And if your argument and if your argument is the state governments are very good, the state hospitals are very good, then fine. Let assume for a moment that the upper middle class and rich are going to private hospitals. Well, that's leaving more beds for the middle class and the poor, according to your thinking. I'm not even saying you have to even have that bifurcation. You can actually have reimbursement based on patients, even for the poor to go to private hospitals. And maybe that reimbursement is not good enough for some private hospitals and nursing hospitals. They won't accept it and it'll be good enough for some. You know, you can have a voucher-based system. Many things can be done. But the fundamental uh, instant reaction of most politicians was, oh, my God, we cannot have profit here. And to me, that is a very terrible sign that in 2020, we still have to go through the same lessons again and again. Uh, because, you know, this is actually causing lives on the ground. I mean, I've been in touch with people. Somebody from a second-tier town in Gujarat could not rush their mossy in time to Ahmedabad or Mumbai. And, you know, she died. And so, so this is this has got real consequences in terms of how we think. So th we have to understand just grandstanding does not solve problems. Now, even on the deaths part, you know, we are uh, we have to understand that you are rightly mentioned. We have touched about 100,000 cases per day. But deaths are around 1,100 deaths per day right now. Uh, and over the last few weeks and couple of months, the number of cases have definitely risen faster than the number of deaths. But to some extent, it is because of more testing. I think we're doing about 10 million tests per day. That's also, therefore, resulting in a lower mortality rate. There is a bit of a lag. And as, again, Amitji was saying, that we know it, the protocols are much better in terms of how to help people who have the serious cases. But just imagine, so around 25,000 people die in India every day. Even if you assume that the 1,100 people on COVID is actually the reality is 2,000. Let's assume for a moment. Even though, by the way, some of the people who are dying of COVID or comorbidities would have died nonetheless. Some of them, not, not all of them. So there is a bit of subtraction to be done as well. But leave that aside for a moment. Assume that the number is 2,000 per day, right? So that's still 23,000 more people give, who are dying of other diseases or natural causes or accidents, what have you, every day. We do not have that kind of moral panic around that right now. Uh, I was just reading uh, news articles that, you know, for example, when you had a severe lockdown for a few months, uh, a lot of vaccines, which had nothing to do with the coronavirus, were, were paused, right? I and mean, there are all kind of public health effects because you, you basically stopped life completely. Now, again, I don't want to have a 2020 judgment on what should have been. I think to some extent, in an ex-ante, risk-averse basis, um, and being realistic about the way politicians are perceived in a democracy, what was done in March and April and to some extent May was understandable, early May. 
but i think as but after that it was uh, see you have to understand in a, in a in a strange sort of way it is very heartening that despite being a 2000 dollar per capita income democracy we are valuing the incremental life so much i mean it is really heartening and i don't want to go into any personal details but having my own family gone through covid i think it's kind of heartening that we are trying to think like that but because we are a 2000 dollar per capita income society and we try to have an even harsher lockdown than the richest countries on the planet then once once the bill came for that in terms of the economic damage and because we now do not have that kind of money for the fiscal stimulus so what was the use of pretending to be rich when we are not eventually right and if and to the extent that we were perhaps richer or we could have pushed a bit more than we could have i think even now we have much more fiscal space then why have that kind of small and poor country mindset and get scared by credit rating agencies and this committee report and former rbi deputy governors and nk singh committee reports and frbm well then say we'll do a fiscal stimulus what is required is to be done is to be done you know world war 2 led to a massive boost in the us debt to gdp ratio it was a war this is kind of a war i mean we also also have a real border war happening with china so if if then we should actually walk the talk and i'm not saying the government will not uh the government's officials have been saying that they will go for a big fiscal stimulus again um once the lockdown is completely off the table uh which might happen i personally think just looking at the shape of the graph and looking at other countries and i could be completely wrong that the debts moving average of the debts per day will probably peak by end of this month um it seems like because the the, the slope is getting you know uh lower and lower and lower so it we might by end of september or early october peak at i don't know 13 1400 1500 deaths per day uh and therefore and uh, you know the delhi metro has opened um railways have not opened yet but a lot of flights have opened uh, cities are gradually opening i do hope by october we really open up because at this point again as amit ji was saying now we know what to do with the patients right so what is the point of now being locked down I mean, in Calcutta again, we we had complete lockdowns for four five days last month. Nobody was. I don't see how that helps anybody. Uh, so I think the the there are many. We are lucky. We are a young society. Um, we're lucky that this happened to us after China, Italy, New York. We could catch up on the protocols and how to treat the people who were infected. But in many ways, this has also shown the brittleness of our system. Uh, that the the instinct of going after profit. even at the expense of actual help and supply being created and the uh, you know i i'm a big fan supporter of gst but the gst kind of law has to think of state incentives for revenue creation uh, even when this five year guarantee ends uh, local chief ministers can't change their revenue they can only change the spending and that's not a good system for being fiscally responsible at the state level so a lot of issues have come to head because of coronavirus that's the negative side I don't know I mean by nature I am an optimist I definitely want to flag the optimistic sides of one big optimistic boost which has happened which could have happened even with a lesser lockdown is the massive digitalization boost which in turn has fed on the 4G to geo and then the UID aadhar and jam trinity things that are already happening and therefore the work from home phenomenon which a lot of people thought well maybe people will not be comfortable maybe they are not but productivity on the whole has actually been flat or slightly up so maybe being distracted by your family and kids in the home is more than balanced off by not doing a long commute up and down and doing silly meetings in office and doing chit chat in the office canteen or whatever the equivalent is right so it seems that's a huge positive for india because of two reasons first um, our major export is actually services exports uh, so that can further if 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 somebody is leaving san francisco for austin they can leave san francisco and go to bangalore right so so the the global capability centers and all that bpo then kpo and the third wave of services outsourcing is only going to accelerate and after the initial pain of the lockdown the indian outsourcing companies have actually done very well in this pandemic so there was a bit of an early kind of jinxing because of the lockdown and people could not go to their offices but the work from home has worked very well so that that means good days for the indian economy in the future now within india as well most jobs were in a few metros and if some jobs people can go to their hometowns or tier 2 cities you know rental costs real estate living costs are much lower 
and therefore the purchasing power goes up. And the same thing which happens internationally will happen domestically. You know, real estate boom will happen, but not on price. It will happen on quantity. Uh, the government, in a strange sort of way, has got a fresh start, right? You know, how a new CEO comes in a company and they basically find out all the poison in the company. They put it in their first quarter. They write it all, all off and then they have a fresh start. So in a, in a strange sort of way, this pandemic, you know, as terrible as it is, and it will continue to have a lot of damages, has given a fresh economic start option to the government of India, I, I, which I think they will exercise it. But if they don't, that would be really worrying. Uh, so I think there are a lot of positives in the long run. Uh, it, we are at $2,000 per capita income. The US is more than $60,000 per capita income. Our youth are ambitious. They're focusing on education. So if the world gets more, more digitalized, it's all the better for India. So, you know, there are positives that have gotten accelerated. But really, our political culture, our regulatory culture, our judiciary being overly intervening in economic issues, and this sense that somehow health and education and people related to health and education should not make a profit, and they, they should just be saints. I mean, they are great people. I, I, I started my point of view by thanking those doctors. But that does not mean I don't want them to make money. right? I mean, I, that, that is just the wrong way to think how society should function. Um, you know, not saying that money motivates all of them, but money is one aspect of it. And we need to get over this hypocrisy and this cant because, you know, what happens in, I mean, just as a quick analogy, when in, in education, when you ram down on for profit, only politicians who are connected to the state government end up owning schools and colleges. It's not like profit doesn't happen. It just goes away uh, under the table, right? So I, I think this is, it's a good moment for us to say profit is required. Profit is good so long as it is legitimate, honest, regulated. And it and when you want a lot of supply, that is the last moment you, when you want to clamp down on uh, private sector because of their for-profit motivation. So I think that I'll, I'll leave it at that and then we'll take it as per the discussion. All right. Now, now I, I, I have to make a few <coughs> comments here because we have to talk about these things. It's like the big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. People can judge me for all they want. I still, and we'll start with the medical stuff. And that's why I want uh, Amit to come in again. Now, here's the thing. The moral panic, very good word Ram used. Ram used a very perfect word like moral panic because there is an association of a lot of moral panic so, uh, with COVID. Now, no, imagine if there was no Sweden. Ram knows what I'm talking about because I've discussed this with Ram so many times. I was like, if imagine if there was no Sweden, what would have been the level of moral panic associated with COVID? Because we all know what Sweden did. They basically said, we're not locking down. They did not lock down. Uh, till the extent of mask wearing, I was looking at a data actually on mask wearing. Americans, uh, on an average, statistically, were wearing the same number percentage-wise of the population uh, when it comes to masks as Europe. And everybody is shellacking America because obviously they like to dump on Trump. Now, this is not a pitch for Donald Trump. Everybody knows I'm not a fan. But the point is that nobody looks at data. Now, but I don't want to talk about Sweden. So I've been in touch with some friends in Pakistan. And you can hate me for discussing Pakistan all you want. But that damn country basically locked down in April. Uh, they have the most good looking, uh, you know, in Hindi like manga in the world, who basically locked down over so long, passes, they do, passes, they do, kind of, you know, and nobody gave him money. So he was like, Hune ki karna khol deo. So he opened up the country. Now, Amit Mirko, I'm going to tell you in Hindi, you will answer in English. Why is there no corona in Pakistan? We will get testing, we will get cases. If we don't do testing, we will get cases. But if we close our eyes, we will not see the world. What is it? Imagine, uh, Amit, we saw photos of Shia protests, uh, you know, <laughs> happening in Pakistan right now. Thousands of people on the streets of Pakistan with their big beards and no masks. <laughs> then nothing is happening. And I keep talking to journalists in Pakistan. Obviously, I'm not going to take names because we never know what Pakistan government is going to do to their government. And they're like, and I asked them again, they're like, actually, it's not 
But how can that happen then? Can can somebody in their right senses explain Sweden and Pakistan to me? I mean, imagine if there was no Sweden and Pakistan. We all, all, I mean, I don't know who was standing under the tree and who was sitting under the tree. So I'll I'll take a shot. I think at least for the case of Pakistan, I think their median age is even significantly lower than India's. Um, you know, Bangladesh's median age is less than India, and Pakistan's is further lower than Bangladesh's. I think a large part of the Pakistan's low numbers is just not enough old people. Um, now, but what uh, Amitji said is very true that I don't think a lot of tests have happened there. Uh, so I'm sure a lot of problematic cases and even deaths. much more than india would have gone unreported but i think age is a massive factor i think as far as sweden goes i don't know see sweden um is also you know sweden we sp- we speak of sweden but we don't speak much about taiwan or japan right i mean they did not have lockdowns uh, they did have lockdowns unlike sweden but their lockdowns were not that strict and even after the lockdowns are opened their fatality rates are very low so i think what happens is in these relatively small countries with very competent states and relatively homogeneous societies uh there does seem to be much more discipline right so i mean just because you did not have a lockdown does not mean that people did not take precautions in a place like sweden now maybe you were saying that the european numbers as a whole uh compared to the american in terms of mask wearing was similar so i don't know how the european numbers break down in north versus south and east versus by the west. way I, i i don't mean to cut you off but sweden did not even wear masks So, so I I don't know. Maybe maybe what they understood was people who get these uh, the, get the infection, you quickly have quickly take them to hospitals and just make sure they're treated well. Um, and I, maybe that's what happened. They have enormous state capacity. They're very prosperous society. Uh, so I I I would and maybe also the population that, density is. Here. I think the also density. Also the population is, density is very good. I think yeah. density is a very good point raised here because uh, you know remember Dharavi obviously had fifty seven percent. infection a month or two ago right based on antibody tests um you know so dharavi is probably the most dense place on the planet um you know sweden all scandinavian countries are massive and populations are very small so maybe you know there is a bunch of factors but i think it's if we always were a disadvantage in that in sense right i mean there are a lot of people here with a lot of comorbidities even if that's more skewed towards the middle class and upper middle class like you know some kind of hypertension or obesity or diabetes um so i wouldn't really compare ourselves to pakistan because even 6 7 years of difference in the median age uh once you reach these, what happens is if you have a difference of median age of 4 5 years the percentage difference in the 70s and 80s brackets can be much higher i mean that the it, the number the the fraction is not linear um so maybe part of that is just not enough very old people Uh, but that's Absolutely. just my guess i have no way to know other way so, to I'm look at this uh, to give a very quick context shall is that uh, you know harsh made a point that 25000 people die in india every day and say an additional 1000 are dying because of covid now if you look at that in context it's 4% of the overall fatality so if you really want to hide you can hide right so if you, therefore if you don't test and if you are not as open a society as say europe or us where there is a lot of data available in a country like pakistan a lot of fatalities might be happening and we won't even know it the other quick point i want to add again when people look at data is again when i look at say data from my home state andhra it's tracking a 0.9% case fatality rate and adjacent state tamil nadu is at say 2% uh you know uh, maharashtra is at some 3 4% and we are always trying to find answers as to why it is so and we have to realize that these borders are in very many ways artificial right it doesn't at that border between t and andhra you know people are not dramatically different it's just that the level of testing that's being done right the amount of disclosure that's happening the amount of measurement that's happening all of those things so i don't think we should read too much into you know some of these data but i think coming back to the sweden example there are always multiple kind of causes there are a healthier population for starters they don't smoke that much and there are kind of number of factors but i think this entire belief that there is only one way and you have to kind of shut down or lock down and you know uh, do things uh, is i think wrong uh, and there are kind of different ways of dealing with it and comparing with 
uh, smaller island countries like New Zealand or, you know, that's also not useful because you know, each country's context is very, very different. But I think by now we have a lot of data. We have a lot of understanding. And I think we should make policies that work for us rather than, you know, with all this comparison. Okay, I, I want to get Amit in. So, Amit, what do yeah, you so, think? So, what about Pakistan? Explain, Kar. <laughs> when we will test, but the fact is that there are uh, some articles which I read which say that even the centers they have made don't have much occupancy. If you government center, they don't know where they are. No, no, they just I mean, don't. They correct. seem to be not getting affected by COVID. And, and believe me, I've actually yeah. confirmed it with four or five journalists who are serious journalists in Pakistan. They've confirmed it. There's just something yeah. not happening in Pakistan. And I just keep asking. And everybody, you See, know, in India, the Pakistan word is so charged that you can't even ask a genuine like question about yeah. Pakistan. See, the, uh, there is one factor which I'll just say. The initial lot of people who came in from other countries like China, Italy, in India, the numbers were massive. Right? Pakistan, ne kya kiya? they didn't let those buggers in. They let, they let their your students are there. Pakistan, Chinese, China, mein hai, wahin pe raho. right? It was a very cruel thing to do, but when you look at what their healthcare situation is, it may not have been such a wrong thing to do at the end of the day. You know? So they cut off people from coming in much before anybody else. That is one thing. So the spread itself didn't take off as much. Now it is possible that they are two months behind us and that they will explode after two months, right? Because we also were laughing ki humare ko kuch nahi wa, humare ko kuch nahi wa, and you see us now, right? So it is extremely possible that two months down the line, Pakistan will be where we are today. So we can't rule that out also. Each country has followed a different graph depending on what their policies were. Sweden had a semi-policy. A lot of their elderly population died because of it. You can't say they weren't affected. They were affected. They have an elderly population which is large and their elderly population did succumb to it, uh, which may be okay for them, but I would not be very comfortable with that. All the same, I'm not a fan of lockdown anymore uh, because as, as I said, that it's not helping anyone right now. And keeping people indoor also is not helping anymore, really. Because uh, uh, how long are you going to keep people in there? This is not going to get over till next year, mid at the earliest. It's not going to get over. Because you see the numbers are only rising. We thought that, chalo, garmi ho jayegi, corona jal jayega. Then, barish aayegi, corona dhul jayega. If it's thandi ho riya, then corona freeze ho jayega. Nothing seems to work on it, right? It's just gone on and on and all through all the seasons. I don't think the numbers are going to come down anytime soon. And the way the second wave has started without any warning whatsoever and we have nice amount of festivals coming up further there are plenty of opportunities over here for it to spread again and again so jab tak pure population ke through run ho ya virus uh, anti vaccine aa jaye apni finally we get a vaccine and it's it's given to everybody tab tak ye cheez nahi jaane wali hai is now my considered belief that we have, we have to live with this thing for the next year and manage somehow Saving grace being that we've just gotten better and better at picking up cases and uh, treating them. But I don't think sitting at home is an answer. You let people out and let them move about, but make sure that they are wearing the mask the right way and that uh, isolation is somewhat at least being maintained a distance. You know, utna bhi agar thik se ensure kar diya and scold every damn person who pulls their mask down while talking to you. Uh, you know that should also, uh, you know. Be a reasonable uh, thing. The baki jisko hona hai wo hoga. Elderly populations should be at least somewhat protected, you know. And maybe there is some role of giving elderly population prophylaxis and BCG vaccine, uh, just to whatever you can do for the time being, right? Because AstraZeneca trial has restarted, but it it may take. There are going to be stops and starts. I don't see any mass vaccination program happening till middle of next year. At the earliest, the vaccine would come out in Feb, March. At, by the time you start distributing it everywhere, it would be June and July. And I hope they don't make the same blunder that we all will They should just make it freely available at every single chemist in town and let the GPs give everybody. That will simply be the fastest way to get it across. Just the se chal tha, that government will do everything and then they are not able to manage. And then that you can't have a trickle down for mass vaccination. 
you can't do it that way it, if you want it to reach you have to make sure that the number of availability is high and that it's available at every every nook and corner and every chemist can give it then you will uh, be able to do this really fast i don't think government alone would be able to do it also yeah so uh, yeah. one more thing i wanted to follow up on this uh, and again i want all three of you to chime in on this uh, nobody wants to talk about it that there are 1000 approximately 1100 people that are dying because of covid tragic as that is the government decided to <clears throat> shut the country down and in the last 5 months because we see the biggest elephant in the room is the kind of money india spends as a country as a percentage of its gdp on the overall healthcare uh maharashtra government uh, and this is nothing to do with the current or the past governments we've just not spent more than 2.6 to 2.7% of the gdp in maharashtra on healthcare at a national level india does not spend more than 3% of its gdp on healthcare now when a pandemic like this happens the one discussion that everybody should be having is why were we so ill equipped as a country where do our priorities lie now when when the pandemic hit everything was focused on covid now i'll just use this as an example because it it just gutted me at a personal level that i was so disturbed after reading that stat, uh, stat that in the state of meghalaya and in in multiple northeastern states uh meghalaya had 10 covid deaths but because the entire health infrastructure of the state was basically focusing on covid we came into a situation that prenatal and postnatal care i'm just using this as an example prenatal postnatal care was completely neglected in the state of meghalaya which caused around 90 women and and 900 children to die so you have 10 kids dying of covid if we would have kept covid open i'm willing to concede maybe 50 people would have died 60 people would have died okay 100 people would have died now this is when i talk about pandemics and policy making right this is a policy decision you made a policy decision to lock down the state of meghalaya you did not assess what are the prenatal postnatal healthcare facilities in meghalaya you did not assess what's going to happen if these things shut down and you have And, and i say this with no shame at all we have killed those thousand people the state government and the central government with its policy making has killed those people those small babies those 900 babies and by the way they say that's a lower estimate i don't know what kind of carnage we have created approximately approximately outside india i think the number was 67% percent, percent of polio drops have not been given in india on time 37% of tuberculosis uh, vaccinations to be given to kids have not been given on time uh, i read the stat in us i think ram might know about this or might find this interesting 30% of early onset cancer detection has dropped in the united states of america now we know what happens when cancer is not detected at an early stage your probabilities of dying from cancer are going to increase because if cancer is detected at a later stage now everybody in their moral panic keeps talking about covid deaths right. okay let's talk about it but where am i wrong if i say that lockdowns are actually killing more people and we don't even have anyone in this country the media discusses sushant singh rajput usne weed le li mujhe drugs do और फिर कोई और आके कोई चीखे मार रहा है अभी किसी का बंगला टूट गया आई एम नॉट जस्टिफाइंग एनी ऑफ इट बट नॉट इवन अ सिंगल डिस्कशन इन दिस एंटायर कंट्री एंड लेट्स स्टार्ट विद राम हियर राम द एंटायर कंट्री इज गोइंग मुझे ड्रग्स दो बट नो बडी इज एक्चुअली टॉकिंग अबाउट I don't know how many people are going to die because of this lockdown in India. I don't care what happens in developing uh, developed countries. They can handle it, man. I mean, imagine this Ram I have personally received photographs of people hanging themselves on the restaurant uh, in their restaurants on the fan because they couldn't afford it. The suicide data, by the way, Ram is not available in India. The government is not uploading suicide data in India right now. This government, the central government, they know it has hit the roof. They they refuse to share it. Now, why aren't we discussing this? Isn't this also bad policy making, killing people, Ram? Where am I missing anything? What am I missing? I don't get it. 
So I think I come back to the same point that I made on trade offs, right? So when you take a decision, there is no solution. When you try to, you know, you know, put this fire down, there are some other fires that are kind of raising. And I think this is precisely the conversation that one should be having as a policymaker, saying we're doing this and what are the trade-offs and what are the acceptable trade-offs, right? Uh, sometimes the trade-offs are, uh, um, are in the same kind of measure, so life to life, right? So in this case, so I am saving 10 lives, but I'm taking, say, 100, so it's, it's a really bad trade-off. And sometimes they're not like to like comparisons, right? So I've killed businesses. Uh, and again, it comes to all this moralistic argument saying, you know, do you want a restaurant to open instead of saving your life? But then again, all of these have consequences. Ultimately, it'll all end up in, you know, lives being lost. Same thing with mental health, right? And Amit, as a doctor, would know this. Uh, the very, very strong link between, you know, vitamin D, sunlight, and depression, that if you lock people inside their homes, uh, not even, you know, kind of getting them, allowing them to kind of go for a walk or whatnot, your depression numbers are going to go through the roof. And in the U.S., fortunately, those numbers are available, and I don't remember them off the top of my hand, but, head, but you're just looking at something like four to five-fold increase uh, in depression and suicidal tendencies, right? particularly among young people. Right? And that's a population that's least affected by COVID, but most affected by the lockdowns, because that's also the population that wants to be with the peers, you know, the people that they're going to grow up with. And you, I, it's ridiculous to kind of lock, you know, lock up a teenager in a house. Uh, they don't take uh, 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 these things particularly well. And, and therefore, I think... One big thing, I think, why a lot of these things seems acceptable, again, is this moralistic arguments. Have we done everything? We should do everything. We should listen to science. We should go for a lockdown. A lot of people proposing this, I think, are coming from one school of thought. And as a good policymaker, you should have the devil's advocate. You should have enough diversity in the room. And who is telling you that, no, this is not a good idea because there are other consequences. Now we have this tunnel vision. And COVID and COVID is the only thing that we see, and therefore we're ignoring pretty much everything else. And all of this is going to come back to kind of bite us, particularly the, the some of the you know issues concerning the economy, which are going to last. If Amit says you know uh, we're going to have this for the next year, the economic impacts are going to be you know much longer. And Harsh would kind of comment on it better. The last point on whatever controversies is, uh, is that maybe people had enough, you know, of COVID in the news and therefore they're looking for a release. And uh, whether it's a drug case or a, or any other case, right? So, so they're just looking for a release. I've had enough of this. So let me look at some kind of a distraction. And, and media senses this before a lot of us do. I mean, why are they running with this story? The, don't, they, the, don't they know that what is important? Of course they know what is important. They're running this story because people are watching it. And and the day people stop watching it, suddenly the same reporter will become a COVID expert. He'll become a science reporter. He'll become an economist uh, and start feeding, uh, you know, that specific uh, kind of information. Uh, and again, the last point I want to make is, again, for policymakers as to who to listen to, is uh, I was listening to another podcast, or I think somebody wrote this piece, you know, on this concept of epistemic trespassing, which is an expert in one field uh, giving gyan in pretty much every other field. I don't understand economics as much as Harsh does. I have the least clue uh, uh, on medicine as Amit does, but Amit must have come across a lot of people in his life giving him advice on how to do medicine, right? Uh, and uh, 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 I'm sure Harsh would have been uh, explained how the economics works. And this entire concept where people are coming and giving uh, predictions with certainty, right? Not wanting to say that I could be wrong or I don't know. Uh, and you have these journalists sitting and saying, you know, so many people are going to die and this is going to happen. So we are not only projecting numbers, we are also projecting a lot of certainty. And as a Policymakers sometimes it scares the shit out of you. I mean, these are not some super people. They're like people like you and me. If someone is sitting in front of me and saying, if you don't do this, 
you know, 300, 400 million people are going to die. And that's going to be on your head because you didn't do it. Now, some of the other consequences are not directly attributable to you, right? Uh, and therefore, it's okay. But in this case, there are a lot of like-to-like -like comparisons, whether it's suicides or vaccinations or cancer. But many of them are delayed, right? So the effects of that are going to be spread over a period of time that they're going to happen in future. That they're not directly attributable to your actions, but they should be. But that's not how stories are reported. That's not how data is reported. It's always reported as how many people are dying because of COVID or how many people could have died. Uh, there are always individual stories of somebody with COVID not finding a, a bed. Uh, I hope they do. But there are many more stories of you know, a cancer patient or, uh, or a kidney dialysis case not getting, and to the point of um, what Amit was making, shutting down hospitals. I mean, it's such a ridiculous idea uh, that if there is one COVID case, I believe they shut down just look. I mean, in a country where we have such undercapacity, you start shutting down these things with this tunnel vision, uh, which is a really bad idea. And I really hope we kind of wake up and bring in enough diversity in the room and making some of these decisions. You need a doctor, you need an epidemiologist, you need an economist, uh, uh, you need a public health expert. You need a lot of these people making these decisions rather than you know uh, uh, one type of information coming your way and making a decision purely based on that. Yeah, so Amit, I, I, I wanted to ask you one more question about the zero prevalence surveys that are uh, happening across the country. How can the central government with a straight face shamelessly say there is no community transmission and also publish all the <laughs> zero prevalence surveys where Bombay, 57% slums, 17% non-slum. Delhi, first survey says 22.87% slums. Then it say, goes up in the next survey to 30%. Uh, then in Pune, 62% slums. And I think it was around 30% uh, or what uh, non-slums. Uh, Kolkata, it was 17%. Uh, Chennai, it was 22% if I read, per, if I remember. Like, I don't know why I'm going on reading these things, but I guess I was obsessed with uh, the, this aspect. Now, how can a policymaker, Amit, and you as a doctor, how does it, how does it play on your psychology when you actually see, and I don't care, look, uh, I don't hide my political leaning ever. But the point is, if the central government is going to be so shameless, it's our job as we know Maharashtra has messed up and we, we, we you know, who better than you and I to talk about it. But the point is, even, uh, even the central government, how can they be so shameless that they are, the left hand says, look at this survey. And I'll tell you, I, I clearly remember when they had published the Delhi ka survey, they said 22% people had COVID antibodies. That means the rest of the people better watch out. What, what kind of a survey is that? And the central government is actually writing that on their Twitter handle. So what would your advice as a doctor be to these policymakers in such a scenario? See, uh, regarding the zero service, now I'm beginning to think that the zero service are going to be a pointless exercise, right? Because the antibodies anyway don't last. Now, initially, uh, we thought, okay, this one episode is going to confer lifelong immunity. Now we know that's not happening. I'm getting, we are getting readmissions. Uh, yesterday also, one doctor was seeking advice from me who's a re, uh, who's got a reinfection. Uh, there are now pretty much well-documented cases across the board of people getting infected again after three to six months. So you may have antibodies now, but nobody knows how long your immunity is actually going to last. So antibody studies, again, it depends on the sensitivity of the kits being used. Now, most of these people are using kits which are China-based and uh, the sensitivity of the kits is not great. Uh, the results are also not very good. Local manufacturers are also there. Again, the sensitivity of these kits are around 80%, which in the field translates to only about 60-65%. So you may actually be getting a lot of the readings wrong, first of all. So they are not very reliable. Now, uh, in Dharavi, it was 57% after 60% of the population had left. What happens to that percentage once the population comes back? Right, That percentage obviously drops to 30%, 20%. Now, if you look at the net-net figures, what I gathered, uh, it 
overall uh, among all the people that they have surveyed pan india pan slum urban whatever the figure roughly translate to 10% of the people they have tested roughly we are still way far away from so called herd immunity at 10% right that would kick in only at about 30% at the base that also now we don't know whether we are ever going to have a herd immunity at all or not so i don't think that you know this is a question anymore i think government stopped saying after may june that there is no community spread <laughs> eventually they they just wouldn't answer that question they just say wo baad mein dekhenge wo kuch to you see the way the evasive answers now started coming in okay? oh, that is not relevant anymore that those kind of answers so i had actually put this up when fleets had just started that india becomes the first country in the world to touch 1 million cases without community spread so <laughs> that is a, that is how it has gone unfortunately that is a mistake they did and then i guess they just tried to cover up for it by ignoring that completely later on at least now yeah. with this yeah. survey they are no longer pretending that there isn't any community spread because Fair it's every i see now the thing is that uh, with so much of community spread already happening you assume that one in 10 people already is exposed right what what these now the other thing is that what these people are testing mainly is igg they are not testing igg igm so igg just indicates exposure it it doesn't indicate whether you are actually uh, you know uh, actively infecting others or not so the information which you gather from an igg is incomplete if you are testing positive for igg it doesn't tell you whether you are actively spreading the disease which is what you need to know if at all i want to isolate people who are causing uh, community spread i would want to test igg rather than that right the only other test you have as of now which can tell you this is uh, antigen test but antigen test results are 65% false negative so you in case a person is symptomatic test negative you still have to do a pcr pcr itself is only about 85% accurate and there was a, a very very scary article by a doctor who got herself tested six times after being symptomatic and all six tests were negative and uh, not only did her son test positive she also tested uh, antibody positive after two three months so obviously six reports wrong right so that is how it is i mean this may be an exceptional case but the quality of testing which we have for this disease is not very reliable uh, if from all the test point of view ultimately it's boiling down to our clinical judgment and the clinical decisions that we are taking on ground i'm telling you this we get patients who have tested negative they are symptomatic we treat them exactly as we would treat a covid patient and later on either they test positive or they get cured with whatever we are giving and keep stay, keep testing negative right so tests are of limited value as compared to our clinical judgment in in this cases right now that is what i would say okay so so harsh one one last question to you and then we'll take the live viewers questions because they have asked a lot of questions now i'm just using this comment in the live chat so somebody says i have lost my job and my local mna is not responding and during the election i hope you have heard modi hai to mumkin hai the whole election fight is on modi and and i'm telling you a lot of people have sent me this message start mein aaye modi ji ne kaha ki are bhai aise karo waise karo hum lockdown mein jayenge ye jayenge baad mein har cheez states ko de di gayi hai everything has been given to the states uh, till the extent that i am now seeing the dark side of regionalism that today the honorable chief minister of maharashtra has made a statement that they are la- launching a new campaign my family my responsibility i mean i don't know whether i should laugh whether i should cry whether i should go and just jump off my terrace or bang my head on the wall matlab hum 6 mahine se to my family pe hi the hum log aur to kuch kar nahi the the government to kuch kar nahi rahi hai and if this is the situation harsh again it comes down i mean who is going to ask these people how dare you lock down things when you we just can't manage anything are humko kam se kam kaam to hamara bacha lene dete the i mean i'm not going to talk about what has happened to me at a personal level i can take the blow but the point is harsh those people who worked at many mills and many factories like mine across india they are devastated now and you don't have one politician these shameless people i i say this with no shame at all they are all shameless they don't even come and face us they're just sitting in their corners distracting us on bollywood now 
I mean, how can these policy makers get away with such harakiri? I mean, explain this to me, Harsh. I, and I am pissed off. I'm not going to hide it. Harsh, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. I think this also shows a bit of an upper middle class bias in policy making, right? Um, people who could think of, as you said, you know, you can take the hit and still survive. A lot of people actually cannot survive after taking the hit. And somehow that was not taken into account. And I think the problem got compounded, as I said, because of the fiscal incentives, right? The state and local governments, state governments especially. This thought till fairly recently that they were guaranteed certain revenues and therefore, you know, they will don't have to bother about the economic downside of a lockdown. They just want to be seen as tough. Um, for example, you know, what Mamta Banerjee is doing in West Bengal is got everything to do with politics for the coming elections next year, right? Um, so there are all kinds of rumors going around. You can't really verify about whether they're fully true or not about, you know, hospitals being asked to tell patients to leave relatively soon or tests being done, but not as many as should be done and so on and so forth. Similarly in Maharashtra, similarly in other parts of the country. Uh, so I think, you know, yeah, you, you asked a very right question. You know, what about those restaurant owners who committed suicide? Um, and, you know, so for example, I know the UK has opened up restaurants saying 50% capacity and so on and so forth. So we have a, this lockdown has again shown a very uh, kind of this blunt grandstanding kind of instrument of public policy, um, which is which is our weakness, right? I mean, so I, I really have no answer to this because the point is it seems like the people are happy with distractions by and large <laughs> i mean i i put a, i put a, i put an analogy on twitter that this is like the coliseum you know so long as the people have games in which some people get killed uh, they entertain you know in rome in ancient rome an emperor would be popular with bread and games um so i think i think i think it's a it's a it's a very uh, it's it's a big problem and, and you know i have a feeling anecdotally that the number of suicides would have gone up in the last six months. Um, you made very good points about, about. I was reading a news article today that the number of childbirths being registered in hospitals in the last six months has gone down. So I'm assuming that, you know, pre-COVID, uh, the number of pregnancies did not decrease, right? I mean, so it's, it's clearly there is a bit of an issue of more poor children being born at their homes and all kinds of risks associated with that for both the mother and the child. So I, I think, I don't know, there's no, I, there's, unless somebody, unless some party makes a noise about it, I think right now people are still in a bit of a daze. I think questions will start coming about the economics very soon, maybe early on in the next calendar year. But, uh, you know, I, what has happened is the last part of the very poorest, uh, urban poor, they've gotten some kind of welfare. And actually, we must remember that rural India in economic terms has not done so badly in the last few months. So it's not all gloom and doom. It's Most of the gloom and doom is actually in the cities, maybe including the smaller cities. That actually, um, in this quarter one FY20 numbers, FY21 numbers, sorry, um, the only positive growth was in the agricultural sector. And, you know, unlike two-wheelers and four-wheelers, uh, tractor sales have been increasing, for example. So rural India has actually not done that badly, partly because it's reached there later and partly to Amitji's point about density, right? Um, maybe partly also because of age and demographics. So rural India to that extent has not done so badly. Uh, urban India has and the most vulnerable have been the urban poor. And, you know, all the migrant debates that we heard so many times. Now there is a lot of talk about an urban version of the MGNREGA coming out. Now, NRG has a lot of structural issues. I hope it's not a permanent program. But in the short term, because we don't have a consolidated database of the poor in India, we only have overlapping schemes. So unless you do a universal benefits transfer, in which case you have all the Aadhaar numbers, you don't have any kind of income delineated kind of one comprehensive national database or state level databases even. So you have a food welfare scheme, you have some other welfare scheme and the government gives out money to all of them, to widows and the old people and so on and so forth. So I think uh, in, in the short term, we'll have to basically do some kind of urban poor welfare programs. 
we definitely what we should do is we should what state governments of Maharashtra and Karnataka have done is kind of suspend stamp duty and property taxes, uh, stamp duty to people who buy real estate for the next three, four, five, six months. Because real estate is one sector which can create a lot of blue sector jobs very quickly. Um, so I think there's a lot to be done. We need to pump start the economy. We need to make sure that the fiscal expansion um, does not really, uh, you know, does not really the fiscal limits which have, we have put on our own heads in terms of FRBM and credit rating agencies and so on and so forth. We don't bother too much about it. We need a demand boost. Um, the government has done right in terms of some agricultural reforms, APMC reforms, Atman Edhar Bharat, the rupee is relatively weak, which is good for exports to revive. But we really, really, really in the short term have to focus on unlocking the economy because even without unlocking the economy, even any fiscal stimulus would be silly. Right? There's no point doing a massive fiscal stimulus if half the people are still in their homes. Uh, so we have to unlock the economy. We have to take that risk. And then we have to pump money in the economy, both for the fiscal and monetary channels. I think despite all the damage, we still are not anywhere close to this being incorrigible. But if we do dilly-dally for another couple of months, I am afraid the path dependency of the damage will take over any structural fundamental strengths of the Indian economy and which might further delay the recovery by another few months or a year. So we still have time, but I, we are getting, we are pushing it really very close is what I'm afraid of. Hmm. Okay. Now to take uh, the audience question, Amit, I'm going to start with you because you being the doctor, everybody wants to ask the doctor questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is, it, that's how it always is. So the first, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the first question is, uh, given that COVID is going to continue middle of next year, so how should we go about, because you had mentioned it, so somebody asked this question, how should we go about opening schools? What's your take on the impact of education, especially on government students, school students? See, government, what it has done is, at least in Maharashtra and the municipal schools, they have installed uh, software uh, as well as uh, on they are conducting online classes. So it's not very different from what the private schools are doing. They are also doing it. So uh, I think this problem will not be as bad as what people think. Physically sending uh, the children to school Kids are going to interact with each other and they are not symptomatic generally, but they come back home and they can infect everyone else at home. So I am not in favor of doing those activities which you can conduct offline, uh, online to be done online. Right? Because uh, there is a very high mortality in pediatricians due to COVID. Okay, now this is very unusual, right? Because everyone thinks children, but there is a very unusually high number of pediatricians who are dying because of COVID. And obviously they are getting infected from wailing, screaming kids, right? Because no mask, they're going to scream on top of their voice. They're going to infect everyone around. Uh, so the risk is for others, not for the kids. We have to understand this. If we are prepared to take that risk or if parents are also young, not living with their elders, you can think of going back to, but we are not that kind of a society, right? We uh, would be better off conducting classes online. Uh, it's not going to get better though, uh, but this academic year, at least I think is going to go completely online. All right. Okay, so Ram, now let's go to, uh, I think, okay, Amit, I want one more question because that's also about healthcare and then I can go to Ram maybe with another question. So uh, Tanmay has asked, is there a silver lining anywhere in this mess? Has our healthcare spending infrastructure response process uh, improved significantly across the country, Amit? As per you as a medical professional, do you see any improvement? Yeah, you can see the mortality numbers are coming down. We are learning how to tame this beast, so to speak. Yeah. So mortality numbers are constantly falling and uh, from 3.8%, it's now down to 1.9, uh, 1.8% overall. And we are on ground, I'm telling you what we are doing. We, uh, we know how to manage this thing right now. We try to pick up patients early. 
we screen patients who are testing positive at least in the private we are doing this the problem is that most people have been uh, told ghar pe baitho now ghar pe baitho or pulse oximeter dekho right agar saturation kam ho raha hai to hospital mein aao nobody has told them what saturation they are supposed to come to the hospital right so many of them come hunting for a bed once their saturation goes below 90 by then a lot of lung tissue has already been lost and they get serious and they come now we need to focus on uh, community awareness regarding early identification of patients who are likely to go bad and we have a lot of data for that now the basic test for people who are testing positive for is a ct scan ct chest uh, is a very very good test compared to all other tests i would say uh, to pick up patients who are likely to go bad so patient who looks fine has got a saturation of 98% but the ct score is uh, maybe 20 by 20 out of 25 or 21 out of 25 means this patient is going to go down no matter how good he looks you can identify people early now so we identify these people early how we brought them out early down we brought it down like that we are, we are aggressive in identifying the people who are going to go bad we start remdesivir early we start oxygen empirically early on these patients right and they all uh, almost all of them rather i would say do pull out successfully eventually we may give steroids also relatively early in the course tocilizumab we would give at the first sign that the patient patient is going into a storm though the uh, data says that uh, the company also said that tocilizumab doesn't work but i can share dramatic uh, improvement on x-ray films after giving a single dose of tocilizumab where the almost the entire lungs were wiped out and in 48 hours the lungs after giving tocilizumab the changes dramatically show reduction on x-ray so there is actual physical documentation that these medicines do work even though uh, studies may or may not show it and now studies also i would say see now there are two studies which came out of the same institution ltmgh one study is saying that uh, there is no survival benefit with tocilizumab and your uh, uh, extension uh, uh, tocilizumab is what yeah. so there is survival benefit no survival benefit to, to tocilizumab and the stay gets prolonged there is another another study from the same institute which says that there is a survival benefit as well as shortening of stay so unless we do what is called meta analysis right of centers across the world going by sin- single center studies or isolated data and also we need to classify what stage the doses have been given because if you see the most doctors who are working on ground will tell you that this disease is all about timing you time the medicines right you start the treatment on time everything will go right if the patient has come late and doesn't give you time you can't do much like a person who is calling us up and telling us ke saturation 60% hai is likely not to make it okay saturation 50% hai is likely not to make it if a person has a saturation above 80% 90% we can still go very aggressively and try to save these patients so we get patients abhi uh, with saturation as low as 20% 30% these patients are not going to make it they don't have any lung tissue left to save so you know it's also the question as to when the patient is coming up you're giving tocilizumab to a patient who's already in that condition where his full blown cytokine storm and the lungs are already you know physically injured and the irreversible changes of renal cell failure and uh, thrombosis and everything have already set in then it's obvious that you can't save these patients so it's very very imperative that we pick up patients as early as possible we should focus on early diagnosis not of the infection which is now everywhere but of tests which can diagnose the people who are likely to go into complications earlier the better and there are some simple blood tests uh, an x-ray chest a crp all right uh, of a serum ferritin or ldh these are simple simple blood tests by which you can identify the actus peculiarly diabetics are especially notorious uh, uh, for developing hyperglycemia this disease messes with the system so badly we get people non diabetic people with sugars of 300 right if a non diabetic comes to me fever and sugar is shot up to 300 it's like okay you know covid causes hyperglycemia why nobody knows diabetics who come in sugar is 500 plus well controlled diabetics the sugar suddenly disappears so unless we document all this 
right this i am talking this all this from personal experience there are no studies which are telling us this but we are seeing what's happening with the patients right so this is where we need uh, to have a proper awareness among people why we need to tell them that if they are higher risk population they should be better off getting admitted rather than trying to treat at home right now people are so afraid that they are trying to prolong their home stay as much as possible and therefore coming to hospital late and therefore causing unnecessary mortality which was preventable hmm. so we need to get that organized that this disease can be reversed and only a very very minuscule number of people will die provided they are coming to the hospital on time They should not be afraid to come to the hospital. Uh, right now, most of the fears are social fears, and very few fears are related to actual bills of the hospital, etc. Most of the hospital bills are actually not that large. Also, uh, it's another thing that you know that that has been played up in people's mind. That both bills are both bills are. It is not true. Most of the hospitals are actually not charging too much. And also, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, I think you can. Yeah. So, uh, Rav. So the question is for you: Is shouldn't the epidemic law be append, uh, amended to make scientific institutions partners in testing? So the person who's asked this question says, "I work at BARC as a biologist, and we had both trained people and required instruments. A mere guideline was given, which was not even taken seriously by our seniors." So, Ram, how do we respond to that? <laughs> so I think <clears throat> the. I mean, if it, is the question on testing? Uh, it's basically on the attitude. It's like we, 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 we. As once again, policy making does not consider. A, a, so uh, let's say in policy making is always uh, about you know what are the second order, third order effects along with the first order effects, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to deal with the second order and third order effects. we have to consider the fact that we have to have parallel organization doing this thing so this person works at brc and says that we could have done the testing in brc we were ready but the mm. policy makers did not even think about it and they just sent a note to brc ki ha dekh lena mm. so what so what would you do in such a scenario what would you tell a policy maker i think that's a point right i mean often when there is one thing you can blame is on tunnel vision that uh, i lay put all my eggs in the icmr basket or the public health care basket uh, without having an understanding as to how big the challenge is and therefore i need everyone else the second thing some of the policy makers are really needlessly worried is control right so how do i control these multiple players if i give them a leeway to kind of uh, play in this right and the only limited number of institutions that they can control and therefore they don't allow access to either private healthcare providers or you know the rb or some of these other institutions which have kind of a lot of capacity you require some level of openness right so for example early on i saw that on n95 masks the biggest source of those masks are companies like apple in the us right because they were sitting on millions and millions of these masks in stock so unless you have little bit of kind of an open mindedness and saying where it can help come from uh you will not kind of open up to some of these things uh and ultimately i think it boils down to who are these people who are making these policies and how much of understanding that they have will all of this affect i mean a, a classic case in point is uh, is restaurants I think three days ago, the governor of New York is was saying that you can open restaurants at twenty five percent capacity. Now, imagine a three percent, six percent margin business opening at twenty five percent capacity. Right? It makes no sense. If I were to tell a state government saying operate at twenty five percent capacity, fire seventy five percent of all your bureaucrats and run the state, right? It, it's not kind of doable. Uh, but in many of these cases, I think. Classic tunnel vision. Uh, many of the bureaucrats or policymakers want a lot of control, uh, uh, and, and I think in a situation like this, where we, you have a disease that you don't really fully understand, it's very very widespread. It's highly contagious. You're much better off having a highly decentralized uh, and letting go of that control rather than this one uh, centralized kind of thing at the top. and that extends to a lot of things even simple things like charity right i mean 
as much as you know you want to donate to your you know a pm fund which many of us have but imagine all this money going to delhi and then getting dis- you know distributed down the line it's going to take forever you're probably better off finding a local entity that's feeding you know the poor and kind of giving money to them uh rather than having this highly kind of centralized approach uh and i think if at all i hope when we when all of this is over we look back uh dispassionately at this and learn some of these really tough lessons as to what are the mistakes that we have made i don't have i'm generally very cynical about this uh, uh but i hope there is a voice in the government that says we are going to be looking at this you know uh, objectively and see what are the lessons that we can learn how can we use existing institutional capacity um rather than trying to restrict uh, a lot of capacity and trying to uh, have this highly centralized kind of approach to problem solving hmm so harsh a couple of questions for you because they're related to economics so uh somebody has asked uh, what is the extent of supply pressure that we should anticipate given the reliance on migrant labor and the reverse migration that has occurred and what are the law and order ramifications of the lockdown that are on the anvil given the income pressure that is likely to persist um so the first question i'm not sure you mean supply pressure as in worker chale gaye abhi i can tell you worker wapas nahi aa rahe i mean let's not just discuss that beyond the limit so how are we going to manage the manufacturing sector right because india's manufacturing hubs are usually surrounded around big cities right so it's not like mumbai has the manufacturing but navi mumbai thane bhivandi they're basically surrounded around mumbai now all these migrant workers went back to uttar pradesh now the great state of maharashtra said like i'll give you an example uh, the epitome of bad policy making right so <laughs> if you live in maharashtra train you can't buy tickets in maharashtra so guess what these workers were doing they were buying train tickets from madhya pradesh they would not get on at madhya pradesh they would get on the train in maharashtra so that train comes in maharashtra but you can't buy a ticket in maharashtra so these are the ramifications that cause another one trains are shut in mumbai an average commute of 45 minutes has become 4 hours in mumbai then such a scenario how do you how do you even run the economy so th- i think the question that was uh, asked by the the person who is uh, uh, intending to ask is that's what he means or she means about the supply supply pressure created like even if i have orders like i can tell you everybody wants to move out of china harsh at least in textiles i can guarantee you that i mean i've told you offline that the kind of inquiries that are coming in the export sector right now is unheard of but i can guarantee you know everybody uh, till the extent of getting their workers in flights also can't can't have workers because we've just lost workers now yeah i think i think that's an excellent point i think uh, a large part of the solution will have to be completely restarting indian railways i think that has to be done that's that has to be done as as a priority um i think i have seen your tweets also about you know going from point a to point b of mumbai and i think that may have made sense at a certain point of time but we have to open up local trains buses and whatever metro routes that we can open up um but i think it's going to happen i think as i said delhi metro has just opened up in the last couple of days so i think that has to accelerate i think a lot of workers would also want to come back um from up and bihar to maharashtra and so i i i i think the larger problem uh, not just for manufacturing but also for food prices because remember a, la- a lot of the agricultural produce was actually procured by the government for the various welfare programs uh so the supply actually led to the cpi or the consumer price index being around 7% 6% whereas wpi or the wholesale price index which is inflation at the producer level is actually negative such a wide divergence between cpi and wpi is generally a good sign of a supply shock or supply irregularities uh so like transportation problems or suddenly state boundaries or local boundaries becoming relevant again after they were be- irrelevant because of gst and so on and so forth so i think uh, that problem will resort as will resolve itself as soon as we basically end the lockdown completely 
um, and the rest of the supply side induced inflation problems will anyways end in three, four months because of base effect of last year. So largely the question the person has asked is correct. We've had supply effect problems both in manufacturing as well as even in agriculture to some extent or at least food prices. Um, services is the only major sector or at least formal services where because of the whole digitalization thing you could actually carry on to, uh, to a very large extent. So I don't think there is any way to solve the problem without actually fully ending the lockdown at a national plus state level. On the second question about law and order, um, I think law and I, I have no way to know how much crime would spike because of this. I'm guessing to some extent it would. I think again we were guessing anecdotally that probably suicides have increased. Now that's not exactly a law and order problem per se. But about rule of law, a larger problem is what I'm afraid about is a lot of the local level petty officials must have gotten used to this kind of power, right? Of checking whether somebody their their establishment is open or not, the shop is open or not, this building, this complex. And uh, I would be naive to say that there have been no bribes exchanged because of this kind of new power uh, that the local officials have been granted or have given themselves. So, you know, that by definition is not congruent with the rule of law. And, you know, Bansi is, you know, it's, uh, you know, this is the shark smelling blood after a long time. So I don't know, even when the lockdown is over, you know, you know, will these people's stomachs be full and will they want to harass common people in common small businesses again? So that's what I'm more worried about of the lockdown, not just the present day damage or the health damage, but this kind of discretionary power, which quite frankly, you cannot avoid in the short term. I mean, let's say you tell you open a restaurant sector saying 50%. Now, who's going to go and measure 50% in a restaurant, right? It, by definition, some local inspector. Now, do we trust the local inspector uh, to not look the other way if it is actually 75% but he's given a bribe? Or if it is actually 25% but still ask for a bribe and say, I'll actually say it is 75%. So I think, you know, these, these kind of small, petty uh, bribe-taking opportunities, I think, will really eat at the rule of law, edifice. Because this is really, uh, I mean... People who said we're back to license large, they're definitely exaggerating it. They're definitely wrong. But this kind of mini level, small level discretion is what bothers me. And I have no clear answer as to how quickly it will go back into the hole it deserves to go to. Yeah, actually, this is a perfect segue because somebody had asked the question that does anyone else find it disturbing that each state government is now functioning like a dictatorship and there's no cohesion when it comes to strategies or rules. And I think nobody can feel the wrath of a government like Amit has, who is right now in, embroiled in a in a lawsuit with the with the state government. So I don't want to talk about that beyond a point because I think the matter is in the court and we should not be talking about it. But yeah. So this is something that has deeply worried me and Harsh, you've explained this perfectly uh, that, you know, like after the emergency, I remember one conversation I had with Nikhil Mehra, uh, you know, someone we all know. And Nikhil told me and, you know, his expression in a typical Punjabi style, he's like, yaar, ye emergency ke baad pehli baar aisa lag ye logon ko toh dangerous power mil hai. Ye log toh hi nahi isko. And Nikhil was right. In hindsight, I think Nikhil was right. And I, I was also taking Nikhil lightly. But let me tell you, I as a businessman, I am seeing this. What is happening uh, in Maharashtra? Like the e-pass. Everybody knows what happened with the e-pass. Okay, Amit, uh, you wanted to add something? Please go for it. Yeah, this e-pass, uh, what you're saying, na? they said everyone needs to have a QR code, right? They charged everybody for QR code. They gave uh, e-passes by the thousand or by the lakh, right? Now they say it's, it's not needed and they can just travel on a letter. <laughs> but I think uh, this has been the biggest power grab across the world. Not just in yes. India. The yes. conversation is a lot more in the US is that this level of power grabbing and this level of obedience is dangerous for any society. That's certainly mm -hmm. one guy I saw in India where people were stopping, cops were stopping people in cars, driving by themselves and fining them for not wearing a mask. Uh, I, I don't see the logic of, you know, a lone guy in a car having to wear a mask. Uh, you should absolutely, and, yeah. And, yeah. the second thing you understand is that what is the state's capacity in implementing some of these rules, right? I mean, if you can't stop big crimes, 
are you going to be enforcing all of these things? Uh, yesterday, I think I was seeing a case where an IAS officer was asking a doctor to be arrested because he objected to this IAS officer's comment that he wanted doctors to be held accountable if cases in a particular locality went up, right? Uh, and therefore, you have this, it's it's not right to think that it's happening at, uh, at a chief minister, prime minister level. It's happening at much lower levels. And, and uh, this is this is something that people are not going to relinquish that easily. They've also not, not just seen power coming to them. They've also seen a lot of people complying with, uh, with, with others. And many of these times, these are not very well informed. They're not informed by science. Uh, and I think we should be, you know, watching and we should be careful uh, 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 as to this level of power grab and this level of obedience is is going to stay in people's mind that, you know, you can issue an order uh, uh, and have uh, take like a very, very heavy handed approach to a lot of things. Uh, and it's not something that people are willing to let go. Uh, it's not some devious, you know, uh, uh, bond villain sitting on top, but it happens with, you know, pretty much everyone else. We have seen that you can control a large set of population uh, the way that you want, uh, even sometimes when, when you don't have the knowledge to push some of those decisions. Uh, I, I don't think it's healthy. Yeah. The, Amit, you wanted to add something? Yeah, so exactly because I have been at the receiving end of this uh, because of which I had to eventually move court, right? Now, uh, <laughs> the one minor experience was that Anjana and me are traveling together in our car headed to hospital. The police guy uh, standing at the uh, toll. Toll is shut, right? Police people are standing there checking everybody. Stops us. Makes Anjana go to the back seat. Does this make any kind of sense at all? You know, does this make any kind of sense at all? <laughs> I can understand if it's a stranger. Like, <laughs> this is how people misuse their power at a small level. Now, the reason I had to go to court was because the power to uh, under so-called Epidemic Act. Epidemic Act, by the way, in India is just a four-paragraph act limiting itself to controlling the spread of disease, right? It's just four paragraphs. That's all. Now, the government does, it quotes the Epidemic Act, it quotes the Nursing Home Act, it quotes the Bombay Public Trust Act, right? It quotes the uh, Disaster Management Act, the Epidemic Service, uh, the Essential Services Act, invoking all these acts to blindly regulate tariffs of all hospitals across the state, reserving 80% of their entire capacity for managing COVID, not considering where people who don't need COVID management will go, uh, you know, for their treatment or for their needs, 80% of all beds across the board, what it will cost the person to, to put up with that, right, to, to run the setup at whether those rates are viable or not, right? So these sort of heavy handed and then they go on to the next level where they introduce uh, complaint forums where someone can lodge a complaint if they feel that their bill has been high. And uh, people who are very well affording, right? good class people, rich class people, use this provision to claim money from the insurance company which they have and as well as file a complaint and get money back from us. right? Politicians of all uh, nook and crannies start calling up demanding that their patients be treated on priority basis. The municipal commissioner and his offices start issuing notices to people, calling them, threatening them that you better uh, agree to open your hospital as a COVID facility, otherwise I'm going to jail you. The, they send uh, out letters threatening to seal the hospital and uh, to uh, cancel the hospital's license, even to cancel the professional licenses of doctors if they don't comply with them within 24 to 48 hours of sending the letter. This is how high-handed and uh, uh, the things have gone as far as regulating the people who are helping you fight the damn epidemic and pandemic on the ground. If it weren't for us, you don't have the bloody capacity to manage things. And this is what 700 doctors have died. And 
this just tells how little uh, bureaucrats and politicians actually think of the people who are working on ground to save lives and uh, you know it's it's disgusting that i had to actually go spend my valuable time effort energy to court to stop put a stop to the constant harassment but that's not all i why was i the only one to do this because everyone else is meekly complying and saying ki hum kuch nahi kar sakte hain hum kuch nahi kar sakte hain so it was you going to die like this you can't live up live with this they are going to keep pushing you keep pushing you keep pushing you till you shut down or you leave your practice altogether you can't put up with this right so you know this is how the raw is being misused and it's very very unfortunate that things have come to this pass uh, that these laws now the funny thing is the laws which are quoted not one of them gives the government any sort of such blanket power to regulate tariffs of any private hospital i don't take a rupees benefit from the government in any manner my electricity is in subsidized my land i have purchased at commercial rates i pay commercial rate property taxes i pay commercial rates for electricity and water on what basis can someone order me that i am going to take 80% of your bills without giving you anything and you have to work only on these charges whether you like it or not whether you can afford it or not which sort of barbaric government does this to their people this is such a global phenomenon you know uh, i don't know how many of you saw this video of this police i think in sydney coming into somebody's house and right. arresting this pregnant lady because she put a facebook post protesting a lockdown i mean how is that any different from china right and this is a, an open democratic country and this kind of power grab is is extremely dangerous it's it's a global phenomenon and uh, many of these laws are not going away uh, precedents have been set uh, it's quite sad actually yeah i i agree with you okay so we've reached the time a couple of questions were about pakistan and south korea and we've already addressed that so i'm not going to be uh taking that and just to uh, there was a comment made that i see a lot of people uh, flaunting social distancing norms i'm very surprised why do why do they take it casually especially in the lower strata of society to that person all i can say is you have to understand and i'm and, and let's wrap things up on this and i'm going to wrap things up with my comments here and uh गरीब आदमी क्या करेगा वॉट इज अ पोअर मैन गर डू डू यू थिंक अ पोअर पर्सन हैज द ऑप्शन ऑफ सोशल डिस्टेंसिंग सो वेन वी डिसाइडेड टू लॉकडाउन द ओनली थिंग दैट वॉज गोइंग ऑन इन माई ब्रेन वॉज ओके वी विल शट इट डाउन सो वॉट विल हैपन इज लेट्स यू लिव इन अ स्लम सो द स्लम विल हैव कॉप्स आउटसाइड द कॉप्स अगर स्टैंड आउटसाइड देर गोना मेक श्योर द पुअर पीपल हुर लिविंग इन साइड दो स्लम देर नॉट गोना कम आउट ऑफ द स्लम what are you going to do inside let's say you're going to tell them okay don't come out of the house have you been to a slum ever in your life i've worked in slums in mumbai you have 15 15 people 10 10 people living in small places how can you socially distance so what you know every time people say oh kushal you're like you know like a daisical about people dying i i am worried about people dying but what i am saying is that policy making so abhinav prakash you know someone we all know made a beautiful comment he said india's problem is that we make first world policy uh, policies and we have third world realities and we never accept that and that is why we end up killing more people because we make draconian first world policies and we refuse to accept our third world realities no country in the world see i india should not use the word lockdown what was happening in april especially in april was not a lockdown it was a shutdown we shut our country down like i had friends in canada and america who were still going to the park in april at least bahar to nikal rahe the humko to aisa hai ki ghar ke bahar se aise ek bahut bada godrej ka taala maar diya andar baitha raha hai mar ja tu andar hi jo karna hai kar at the end of the day i repeat in in policy making and in discussions there is something called anecdota where you know an anecdote where I know someone who's a 20 year old kid or a 25 year old kid who was perfectly healthy and lo and behold he passed away because of covid I should shut the whole country down that's not how you make policies then my counter to you would be I know someone who was a perfectly healthy kid walking on the street and suddenly a car came and banged him and that poor kid died ban all cars that's not how you make policies you make policies based on metadata 
you make policies based on meta analyses you have killed more people and i say this with no shame you can call me i am not a covid denier i wear a mask i wear a face shield on top of that i have wash my hands all the time but i know beyond a point that my country social reality is that look in the western nations when they locked down england was like giving a paycheck protection i know america gave some sort of paycheck protection i know england gave some kind of paycheck protection uh, nordic countries gave some kind of paycheck protection what did india give us baba ji ka thullu we did a draconian lockdown far more draconian than anywhere in the world and we did not even give any paycheck protection to our countries and then our shameless politicians say we care for you why are you mad at us kya tumhari aarti utare zindagi barbaad kar di tumne hamari people are committing suicides you have people dying because of absolute uh, nonsensical systems where there is no healthcare infrastructure and babies are dying in this country why because everything is covid 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 and you have no prenatal postnatal care and then you say why am i shouting at all of this why aren't you shouting at all of this why aren't we asking our politicians that after 70 years of living in this goddamn nation we only spend 3% of our gdp on healthcare you can check what america does last if and you can correct me if i'm wrong i think even america spends around 15% of its gdp on healthcare we can't even do 5% in india like ek do percent badha do bhai kuch to karo and then the the biggest lesson that scares me is and let me put it imagine you get a ebola like virus and a covid like contagious scenario we are dead in india all of us are dead oh, koi doctor nahi bachega koi scientist nahi bachega koi citizen nahi bachega and that's what we should be scared about and on your powers being taken away imagine what kind of powers the government has right now if you're a person in maharashtra and you literally walk into a restaurant and you just sit there for 10 minutes do you know you're committing a crime yes what is your crime sitting inside a restaurant and having a chai a cup of tea in a udupi that's our favorite past uh, favorite pastime in mumbai at least you know we go to a udupi restaurant and we have a cup of chai or coffee that is illegal right now and if you're not worried about your freedoms being taken away i think there's some issue with you not me and i'll end today's discussion on that note all i want you guys to do is think about it take care please wear a mask please use face shields but open up this goddamn country and let's move on with our lives and uh, also thank your doctor whenever you see a doctor say thanks a lot to him or her or them please be grateful to those doctors so many doctors have lost their lives saving our lives so be more grateful and on that note i'll end today's discussion once again thanks a lot to all my guests uh, for putting their points across and if you like what i'm doing over here please subscribe to the channel like the video leave your comments below you can become a member on the youtube channel or become a subscriber on patreon i'll see you guys uh, on on the next live stream until then namaste take care goodbye